for no better reason than that every other YouTuber is doing it, here is my top 11 from 2021. And so the first one on this list is The Great Journey uh, from Tim Cope. The book is called On the Trail of Genghis Khan. Uh, Tim Cope is an Australian comrade of mine, and I think he did what is surely almost undebatable, one of the greatest adventures of the 21st century. And in 2004, Tim was 24, 25 years old, and he journeyed on horseback the full 10,000 kilometers between Karakurum, which was the old Mongol capital up in the far east of Mongolia, all the way through the Eurasian steppe, through Mongolia, Kazakhstan, the Ukraine, Russia, finally into Hungary. I don't think any other countries he touched, but finally into Hungary, all the way to the Danube River. And this is a just a beautiful story. It's an amazing journey. He picks up a dog along the way, obviously, which adds um, another layer of emotion to it. But it's a great story because he travels through this he travels along this ancient route, which historically had just been paved by the horses that came before him, the thousands, the hundreds of thousands of horses that came before him uh, and the old Mongol hordes and a lot of the other nomadic hordes that live in the Eurasian steppe. Um, but it was in the modern day. So he would largely be riding his horse alongside a road or he would have to deal with you know a visa for his horses and all types of drunkard antics and people trying to steal his horses and people trying to rip them off but then also the amazing hospitality that he found as well um this book was amazing i think tim cope is amazing i mean he learned russian to do this trip and for anyone who's from australia the idea of learning another language let alone tackling something like russian is kind of uh in itself just this most amazing feat so on the Trail of Genghis Khan, must read. Number two, Upheaval by Jared Diamond. So I'm sure many people are familiar with Jared Diamond, if you're not. He famously wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel, which does, uh, it's such an achievement of a book because the scope of it is just so incredibly ambitious. You know, he just basically wants to explain the history of our world, not really our world, the history of, humanity, the history of where we came from, how we differentiated, why the different cultures might look the way they do, according to everything from economics to geography, to religion, to different traditions, you know, explaining why the agriculture in one place led to a certain type of culture here versus why, say, the, he opens up the book actually with this, you know, thought provoking question. Jared Diamond lived for many, many years in Papua New Guinea, which is that small, outlet of indonesia at the very eastern side it's it shares a physical border but it's a separate country it's just north of australia extraordinarily underdeveloped poverty uh, ridden place uh, but jared Dime was there studying birds i think and he was having a, a stroll with one of his mates there and the thought question came up is why did the english invade the shores of australia and proceed to do all the horrible things they did there rather than it be the reverse that the aborigines built up a fleet of ships and coordinated themselves to create the logistics and distribution possible to uh, to then sail halfway across the world and invade this other people um and the common historical answer was something extremely trite like they were too stupid to do it or you know, the savages couldn't organize themselves uh which is obviously total bs and jared i think tries to answer that question and once you try to answer that question well why did they actually develop differently and so forth it goes down this route but i'm talking about a book a different book jared diamond also wrote this book which makes this list upheaval and I loved Upheaval because it talks about how different cultures and countries responded to different crises. So off the top of my head, there's a chapter on Chile, Finland, Indonesia, Australia, and two or three others as well. Jared Diamond is obviously a terrific writer, an exceptionally smart guy. He's also an old guy, so he's lived a lot. And um, I found so much in the Australian chapter that I knew nothing about my own country, found the Indonesian chapter particularly fascinating, as well as the Finnish chapter particularly fascinating, um, because he covers there how they sort of responded at the end of World War II. They managed to stave off again the threat of Russia, and this time the threat of the Soviet Union. Uh, the Finnish military, the Finnish culture, the Finnish people, their will was so strong, and they were just so 
superior in rejecting them, whatever. And it's kind of a, I don't know, a political economy study. I'm not exactly sure, but the book Upheaval, absolutely remarkable, terrific. Number three, this is a book called The Forgotten Highlander by Alexander, no, Alistair Urquhart. Heard of this book through the jacked erudite host of Modern Wisdom fame, Chris Williamson. He's suggested it to quite a lot of uh, people as uh, just a terrific book. And my word, it is such a terrific book. I listened to this. It was three and a half hours long, I remember. So very short. It's basically a long podcast. And what it is, is it's the memoirs of this man, Alistair, who survived a prisoner of war camp, a Japanese prisoner of war camp in World War II, and truly went into the depths of hell and came out on the other side. It's several miracles how he avoided death. The back half of his life, as he ended up surviving all of this, he was ridden with sickliness and a lot of injury uh, from the toll that his body and mind went through in this uh, handful of years. The types of stuff is a little bit too much for YouTube, though... He was worked out in the Thailand bush under the sweltering malaria-ridden sun and forest and watching all of his comrades around him die on their feet essentially worked until he would die as well, yet managed to survive despite the most impossibly horrific conditions ever. So it's a fantastic book. It's his memoir written at the end of his life and... um, Yeah, don't know what more to say about it. It's brilliant. And if you're interested, my interview with Chris Williamson will be right there. Number four is with uh, the great and powerful Tim Marshall, who wrote two books about geography, Prison of Geography and Power of Geography. This is the latter that I'm suggesting now, just even though I also did Prison of Geography in the last year, just because it's his newest book. But Tim Marshall is an old war correspondent, a lifelong journalist, a terrific writer, clearly, but also a really smart, interested guy, and, um, and an absolute authority on geopolitics, but specifically how geography shapes geopolitics. So each chapter in Power of Geography, as well as Prisoners of Geography, is a different country or region, and they're current geopolitical state is explained through their geography. As an example, there's a giant dam on the border of Sudan and Ethiopia called the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. This has a huge, huge geopolitical implication over Egypt because it essentially taps the Nile. And so uh, Tim does a terrific chapter in the book talking about water insecurity and how the only reason it exists is because of Ethiopia's you know, God-given geography, the geography they were left with. Similarly, you look at Saudi Arabia, the state that they are. I mean, they're so rich because of the geography that they were granted and their worldview, which might clash with many other countries' worldviews, gets to be acted upon more ambitiously and with more effect because they have way more money behind it. And by their worldview, I mean where they invest their capital and so forth. The type of influence that they might have in the world. Otherwise, you look at a country like Brazil. I mean, they have the Amazon rainforest as the majority of their country, and that's the lungs of the world. Do they then have a responsibility to the rest of us to keep their rainforest intact, even though it is their sovereign, technically? Um, Chapter on Australia, United States, the Sahel, uh, China. Many, many, many interesting things. Tim Marshall's Prison of Geography, absolutely unreal book. I have two interviews with Tim which you'll be able to find up there if you're interested. Uh, The next one, which is number five, is Red Notice by Bill Browder. And this was one of my favorite books of the year, for sure. I don't think it came out last year. I think it came out a few years before, but it's this incredible story of a financial manager who happened to get into Russia just as they were transitioning from the Soviet economy, top-down distribution to the most insane example of crony capitalism and kleptocracy that our species has ever seen. And that was what Russia was in the 90s. Um, I I will completely fail to do it justice, any of the anecdotes that he tells in the book. But basically, Bill is a super sophisticated investor who was working for, I think, BCG at the time. Um, He's American, Harvard, you know, has the golden resume. But Yeah, got exposed to Russia and um, went on to create a fund that invested in Russia. And the book does take a severely negative turn and uh, starts becoming Bill against Putin and the Russian government and all the other people implicated uh, with tragic endings. Um, But a lot of good has come out of it. The 
but a lot of good has come out of it. And there is a sequel coming, uh, but I found the first two thirds of that book so extremely fascinating as what uh, an amazing memoir can be. Number six, we've got Off the Edge of the Map by Scott Rank, who I think writes under the pseudonym of Michael Rank. So it's either Scott or Michael Rank. But this is a really small, short book. I doubt has gotten much attention. And it's 10 or 11 chapters of just the greatest explorers of history. So Off the Edge of the Map is people that traveled beyond the map. They did not know where they were going. It's pure adventure. It's as pure as it gets. And obviously, he covers the classics, Marco Polo, James Cook, Anan Cortez, and many, many more, uh, including a man like James Holman, who's one of the honorable mentions, who I will speak about later, um, but also a lot of other explorers that you never would have heard of before. Someone conspicuously not on that list who probably should have been is Alexander von Humboldt, who also had a memoir about him, uh, who also had a biography written about him a few years ago uh, that didn't make this list, but it's called The Invention of Nature, I think. It's fantastic. And if you're interested, I did interview Scott Rank. And at the end, we sort of spoke about some of the ethics of these travels, because a lot of these adventurers weren't just in it for the thrill of learning about a new place, writing about a new place and exploring a new place. A lot of it was this sort of conquest of a new place because with the undiscovered world, where there's literally a place that you hear has these riches and no one actually truly knows, that pure adventure then obviously turns into the colonialism that is famously what it is today. Not good. Disunited Nations. This is number seven by Peter Zion. <clears throat> Probably my favorite book that I read last year. Hard to say, but I think probably. Peter Zihan is the authority on geopolitics. I would say that's a totally subjective claim. Uh, and he wrote this book called This United Nations, which explains, among other things, just how America after World War II essentially created the security that enabled globalization to thrive and prosper as it has enabled the trade routes to be so safe and prosperous as they have been to then allow a lot of other economies enter into what has become our globalized economy. Among other things, there's a great chapter in Brazil that stands out to me for sure. Um, and I think in Peter Zihan actually has a new book coming out this year. Let's hope it's really good. But Peter Zihan, if you're interested in how the world works-ish, not conspiratorial at all, no New World Order stuff, literally the nuts and bolts of how countries and cultures and economics manages to all work together in this big globalized mesh. Peter Zihan's an authority on it. Amazing. He's a good talker too. He's got a lot of charisma. I think that was probably my favorite book of last year, but Disunited Nations was that one. Number eight, The Count of Monte Cristo. So I've uh, this is by Alexander Dumas, this old... 1800s. It was written early 1800s. Famously black author. Um, I It's for sure my favorite story of all time because it's a fictional book. I read very, very little fiction. I think it's just Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, The Count of Monte Cristo in this old time traveling cricketer series from when I was a boy. But um, yeah, The Count of Monte Cristo, I've, I tackled it twice in paperback and actually never got to finish it because it's just a ridiculously long book. And there is one section that just drags on and on and on. And if you're not paying attention, you will just fall off the deep end and never come back to it. But I listened to it on audiobook this year. It's like 40 hours long, something like this, with the amazing Bill Homewood as the narrator. And Bill Homewood is a Shakespearean actor. He gets his French perfect. He's an amazing voice. And him telling the story made it very easy to swallow. And I think Dantes, who ends up becoming, spoilers, the Count of Monte Cristo, is the greatest fictional character I've ever come across. And that's that's across everything. All the great shows, all the great movies, all the great books. Dantes is, for me, the everyman, the one to aspire to. If you're interested in an interview with Bill Homewood, please enjoy. Okay, number nine. This is hard. This Okay, this is very hard because I already said that United Nations was probably my favorite. It's alongside this book and it's called Blood River and it's by a man called Tim Butcher. So there's something about Tims. Three Tims have uh, featured on this list and two of them have done these amazing journeys. Tim Cope, like we started with, with On the Trail of Genghis Khan, but now Tim Butcher with Blood River. In 2004, Tim traveled overland to the Democratic Republic of Congo from the border of 
Rwanda or Burundi up just above the lake on the east side all across the land until he hit the Congo River down through Kinshasa out into the coastline. What made this book so amazing is that Tim is reportedly one of the first people to do this in over 100 years, if not the first, and it might not have been done since he did it. There are legitimately inhabitable places within the Congo and not just inhabitable to live and grow and prosper, but to travel through and not because of the environment, although that is a huge, um, what would you say, obstacle in its own right, but unfortunately, just because of the way that the country has degraded and essentially reversed in progression. Tim is a lifelong journalist and war correspondent. So his writing is a beautiful. I love the way that the book is written because it's so insightful and the prose just very, it's very beautiful. It's very romantic. And he tells a story of what is a shell of a country and this random amalgamation of cultures which shouldn't be together none of it makes sense the congo has inverted its progress while the rest of the world seemingly becomes seemingly gets better infrastructure standard of living raises people have access to more jobs this might not be a universal story but nonetheless it's a general trend the total opposite has happened within the Congo to the point where there's anecdotes of Tim going through this extraordinarily remote place, speaking to one of the old men of the village who this old man in his seventies, eighties lived there when the Belgians were still in control, had seen a car, um, had drunken European beer, had seen thriving restaurants and had seen trains and his grandkids living in what was 2004, had never seen a car in their life. When Tim came in on his motorcycles, the first time they'd seen an engine. So a man 80 years old saw more modernity than a teenager. This is a bad sign. I think we can agree. If you want to see my interview with Mr. Butcher, please direct your mouse to the top left-hand, right-hand corner of the screen. Number 10, beauty will save the world. So this is the second... Um, this is the second book by Bjorn Persson, Swedish wildlife photographer, anti-poacher, um, conservationist, and he's just taken some unbelievable photos. Um, this book is incredibly beautiful, specifically, especially beautiful because what the way that Bjorn's put the book together is he's taken quotes from Roger Scruton, Solzhenitsyn, can't really say that name, to many others, uh, and repurposed it for the sake of praising aesthetics, praising beauty. And so as you go through the book, you are constantly reaffirmed with this elegance and beauty matters and aesthetics matters. And it's put alongside the most artsful, you know, emotionally tasteful photo of say an elephant a cheetah a rhino a whale diving under the ice a beautiful landscape so beauty will save the world amazing book if you want an interview with uh beyond persian have a look there all right finally number 11 plato and a platypus walk into a bar by thomas cathcart and daniel klein this was on nisim taleb's reading list and obviously because of my affinity with the indigenous to Australia animal platypus, I thought this seems like a funky title. What's it actually about? It's understanding philosophy through jokes. It's a terrific book. It's not like you're gonna learn a bunch of philosophy if you read it, if you really, really read it, maybe you will, but it's more just sort of an entertaining read uh, to give you a sense of the type of, not theme, tone, vibe of the book. It starts off with this quote by Groucho Marx. I don't know if that is a real character or a fictional character, but he says, these are my principles, but if you don't like them, I have others. So in that vein, they're kind of taking the piss. Terrific book, Plato and a platypus walk into a bar. Finally, the uh, honorable mentions. So we've got The Invisible Hook by Peter Leeson, which is sort of the economics of pirates. And if the joke went over your head, The Invisible Hook is taking the piss out of Adam Smith's invisible hand, which supposedly is going to you know, regulate a free market. So The Invisible Hook by Peter Leeson. Love that book a lot. Treasure Islands by Nicholas Shaxon. 
this is truly the red pill into offshore finance because offshore finance is more than just tax dodging. Offshore finance is what enables the scale of criminal organizations to get to where they do. And it is the cancer of the planet. It is truly that bad. I'm not being hyperbolic when I say it. Treasure Island's Nicholas Jackson is the perfect gateway drug to that. I have a short interview with him here. Hopefully we're going to get a long one later, but short interview with him here. A Sense of the World by James Holman. This man, James Holman, when he died, he was the most traveled person in history. And I think 1850s, give me leeway, 15 minutes either side, give me a buffer. But most traveled person in history measured by kilometers. And the kilometers, what was it? I forget what the kilometers were. But that is just measured over land. Anyway, what makes it so unbelievably remarkable is two things. One, he did this before the age of the steam train. So he did this all on horseback, horse carriage or on foot. But number two, the man was as blind as a bat. He could not see anything. Uh, he was not a man of means, yet he did all this incredible stuff. Stay tuned. Maybe by the time it's out, the podcast is out, but I'm going to interview the authority, Brian Bashan on James Holman, who himself is blind. So really looking forward to that. Blood Bankers by Jim Henry. Again, similar to Nick Shackson's Treasure Islands. This is a man who was Harvard, Harvard educated, chief economist of McKinsey uh, for several years. He investigated the offshore capital flight crisis of the developing world, Kenya, Nigeria, the Congo, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, Guatemala, the Philippines. It's, it's unbelievable. It's a documentation of story after story of kleptocracy, of crony capitalism, and just corruption at its finest. It's an amazing book. Fallen Leaves by Will Durant. I know, these, I know that he's a very famous American historian, but he's a terrific writer. And Fallen Leaves is his last opinion on things before he died. Uh, it was actually, it was never published while he was alive. These are sort of found lost notes, I think. But it's, you know, on women, sex, marriage, kids, education, uh, the purpose of life, uh, learning, a lot of great things, really some fantastic lines in the book. And finally, the man himself, Peter Thiel, uh, zero to one. It's They'll say it's like required reading for businesses and whatever. I don't think it is. It's just a really, really interesting book thinking about innovation because this is a Talebian idea, but how can we predict a future of infinite possibilities based off a finite experiences of the past? You know, we cannot. So... You as an entrepreneur, do you just do the nth iteration of something that's already around and improve it, which is a totally worthwhile pursuit, but that's not going to create the zero to one value, which is say the discovery of a new type of energy, right? That's the ultimate zero to one, but say a better mode of communication than a telephone, you know, um, X, Y, and Z example. And obviously it's endorsed by Taleb. So when a risk taker writes a book, read it. So, you know, it's going to be good. Anyway, that's all. Um, cheers, big ears. Subscribe and I don't know, listen to my podcast. That would be nice. Ciao.